while appealing to university students to really push Sagita forward, hoping that they'll come to join him eventually. But he didn't have the time or money to, so he didn't get to. And he wants to develop a Lumpa-like association, which he won't title it that, but he wants to develop again to teach to instructors, instructors so they can repeatedly teach to students. Um, and like I said, it's creating a familiarity. What this does is create a, create a familiarity of something that is so distant. You don't know the process, the process of production, and you don't really care about it. You see a book, you buy it, and you think, I'm going to read it, and that's it. But there is such a huge process of production, and he wants the people to understand that. And so he creates this familiarity using things that they can find every day, cardboard, paint, and they create something out of it, and they make it their own. So there were problems with distribution. And at first, they didn't really have a plan for distribution. They thought, uh, Book Fair of, 2000, of Lima in 2004, we're invited to it, we're going to go. So they created a huge stand made all out of cardboard, and people loved it. And they came to it, and it really started Sarita on a roll. And they were really, really popular for a little bit. So they were allowed to temporarily expand nationwide to four different cities. I don't know the cities, so they couldn't remember the cities. But they said that they expanded for a little bit, but they only had one printing to those cities. And then it just died out because they didn't have enough funding to support it. And like I said, they had an underdeveloped distri distribution system. They did not have a central center of distribution. So that was problematic because people didn't know where to go to buy the books. They didn't know where can I go to purchase something like this? Where can I have a where can I buy a cardboard book? They did not know. They had citywide distribution, but it was kind of rickety because they would have agreements with bookstores for commission. If you sell our books, you get 30% of the income, but not anymore. And a lot of bookstores weren't willing to do that because they didn't make a lot of money off of it anyway. And so bookstores would come in and out, and people just wouldn't know what to purchase. That was a huge problem, and that led to an inconsistent funding and sales. Now, there still isn't, isn't really a central distribution center. He says that their workshop is, but their workshop is literally, it used to be a garbage dump in the back of a house. And you can't really enter because it's a private house. So they have a central distribution center, but nobody knows about it, and nobody can enter without a key. Um, he says they still present, he still presents at book fairs, but it's really infrequent because he has a full-time job. He does it probably once every few months, and he doesn't get to do it any more than that. He, on the other hand, he continues distributing through more conventional me methods like bookstores or journals, magazines, any sort of publication like that, but it's not anything that's solidified. So Sarita, like I said, always had a problem with sustenance and more than just funding. And Salda Riaga admitted herself, as well as Vargas Luna, that they had a lot of professional shortcomings that led to its downfall. They themselves did not understand how to run an organization. They didn't have administrative knowledge. They didn't have, like I said, a solid distribution system. And they had no advertising. So people just didn't really know about it. And in addition to that, where I support the idea of a nonprofit organization, they stubborn, stubbornly did not want to conform to any aspect of business or company. They didn't want to have a legal advisor, a financial advisor, because they thought by doing that, they'd be evolving Sarita into something that they wouldn't love, something that didn't belong to the community, something that was increasingly more and more capitalistically, capitalistically hierarchical. And they did not want that. So because they didn't want that, it didn't allow Sarita to push forward. But they thought, OK, we'll allow it a little bit. And they hired a legal advisor. And as soon as they did this, they just felt this drop in passion. They felt like it was no longer theirs. It, was, it, was, it didn't belong to the community anymore. It belonged to capitalism. And they, as their passion ebbed, 
and fu funding did also, they decided we need to move forward for ourselves because we're not gaining anything from this and neither is anybody else. So we, we're gonna move forward, we're going to drop Sarita, we're gonna get our own jobs, start our own families and move forward. But like I said, Salah Riaga did not give up. She found Sanchez who then helped Farhi understand what it was really, really about. And Farhi has tried really, really hard by himself to push this forward. But as Salah Riaga has said, you can't have a publishing organization alone. It's something that needs a lot of members working together to come to a point. You need to have the connections, especially with the cartonero, with the cartoneros. He doesn't, he doesn't contact them at all. He has no contact with the cartoneros. The paper that he's gotten has been donated, which is really important, but he has no contact with the cartoneros, which really undermines the idea of a cartonera. In addition, he does not have a solid customer base. And if you want to be able to have a publishing company, you need to know that people are going to read your books. Vimos has also said that the publication and fabrication of books is extremely disorganized. And when you come to try to develop the book, you try to make the cover and the interior, if you go into it, you need to have a solid plan of how that's going to be, be come about. You need to know funding, the people who are going to develop it. But in the one publication that Sarita has released since 2011, that took over a year for them to publish because they didn't have a plan before they started. So the idea is similar. There are similar po problems with the new Sarita that, that the old one had. They just don't have the organization and planning that they needed to. And Farke has recognized this. He's taken total responsibility for the lack of all of that. He says that he wants to systematize the entire organization, he recognizes the need for a legal and financial and marketing hierarchy. He says that, I know that's important, but I don't have the funding for it, and I need to make sure that I get that down first. I need the funding, and then I'll put those things forward, and then we'll push the rest forward, and eventually I'll have an organization like Limba. But until then, I can't do anything. And he's all by himself, and he doesn't have the time. He doesn't have the money. He works full time in Lima, 60 hours. He works full time by himself, and then he by himself, and then he tries to do this. It's just really, really difficult. I think you can all understand being in academia. It's a lot, a lot of dedication. The goals back then, they did have a goal for distribution, but it wasn't main, which is why a main goal. So that's why it suffered. Um, like I said, they wanted to include everyone, so they used the book object approach, which was creating familiarity with something that was previously distant. They used affordability to appeal to the masses, and they also put, they also placed importance on extremely important aspects in Peru, indigeneity, because they have a large indigenous population, and biling bilingualism. So, Actually, interestingly enough, they worked with a school called Kindergartenera, which was Quechua and Spanish bilingual, and they helped them recognize the importance of recognizing their indigeneity, because in Peru, people who are indigenous are taught that that's not something to be proud of, which is really sad, and they wanted them to understand that that was a good thing. You should learn Quechua just as well as you learn Spanish, and you should be proud of it. You shouldn't be afraid to speak Quechua, which a lot of them are, because they think it makes them look poor. Um, and also, one of their things that they were really, really hoping to do was publish on discovered authors, because like I said, the publishing companies only wanted to publish authors that would give them money. But as they went on, they realized that other companies were publishing undiscovered authors so in addition to that, they would be able to publish already known authors and get more money for it. Um, now, they also, Farhe wants to increase literary consciousness, like I said, but the thing that's most important to him is nourishing the catalog. He wants to make sure that they include countries that are lacking from the catalog, like Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, some other Latin American countries, Central American countries. He also realizes that genres, extremely important. There needs to be equal weight on each genre. So not just poetry or not just narrative. They want chronicles. They want academic essays. He realizes that that's extremely important. And additionally, he has continued with the idea of bilingual text, but actually, 
they published their first bilingual test, text with the coming of Sarita Cartonera in 2011. That was the one text they published. It was published by um, Sarita. The author was Jose Maria Arguedas, who is actually a pretty famous Peruvian anthropologist and a less known poet. So they used one of his really, really obscure poetic works and that appeals to the indigeneity again. He also thinks that special, specialized topics are extremely important. So he's looking at gastronomy, food culture, because in Peru that's huge. When you go to Peru, there are two questions that you're asked. Do you like the weather and do you like the food? And he, he realizes that's increasingly important. I mean, we, we even have two Peruvian restaurants here. So he realizes by introducing specialized topics like that or everyday life, so people who are ignored like shoe shiners or marines or fishermen, that they'll be able to they'll be able to appeal to a greater audience. And like I said, he's looking at institutionalizing, which really means creating connections with people that have the same interests, so NGOs, businesses that will financially support them to push them forward. In my opinion, because Renzo is really looking for an outside approach, he doesn't really have a lot of help, I think that they need to prepare a lot more. All of the problems that they had could have been foreseen and planned ahead. And they could have done that by structuring and understanding that they need a financial marketing and legal aspect, and then putting someone in charge of each of those things. In addition, before you even start to do these things, to push a plan forward, you need funding. And that's something that they didn't have. So they need to appeal to those people before they even start. They need to have a solid business plan, and they need to get funding, and then they push forward with the business plan. Uh, the distributional circuit, clearly very important. A publishing company is nothing without selling the books. And because they already have an invaluable and supportive customer base and the people who are already interested in literature, they could appeal to them, gain a profit, and then use the money that they make from the profit, their revenue. They can reapply that and they can create an educational, like Loom, uh, an educational part of the organization, like Loompa. And by appealing to the customer base and then later the little, the smaller customer base, they can create a distribution center with the, with the revenue. And my idea is that they had an interactive museum. So people would come in, they would see, there would be a part where they just had pre-made books, but there would also be a part where they could watch the cartoneros do their work. They could watch them assembling the books step by step, because they do that all themselves. And even more, they could volunteer to create their own book and then pay for it when they leave being trained by the cartoneros on the way. So they really get the idea of the importance of the production process. And in addition, of course, they'll need exter external distribution connections like the bookstores and journals. Um, they, like I said, need to understand their finances. That was something that they never understood. They didn't know how much they made. They had an idea of how much a book cost. It started at four solace and 2004 and went up a soul until 2006, topped off at six solace until they had to push it past that because they weren't making an income. And then they had two different book prices. It solace for a small book, 12 for a double bound book, which had used rope instead of staples because they would publish thicker, like 100 page books instead of 20 page books in those. But they never knew how much they made. And they never knew how much they had to pay the cartoneros. And that was extremely prob problematic. And knowing how much can I put back into the company so it's productive. Um, they need to have an idea of how the workforce is going to be laid out. Renzo said he's really interested in communal leadership again. So he wants more than one person to be in charge. And they're all going to work together based on their capabilities. And they'll be in charge of the cartoneros again. But instead of the cartoneros staying, because the cartoneros before would stay for a very long period of time, it would be their job. This time it would be like an unpaid internship for half the years. They would work there for six months in preparation for a new job because a lot of those people can't find jobs. And then they would move forward into another aspect of their professional life. Um, they wa he wants artists to come in and train them. I agree with him. The artists should come in and train cartoneros because before it's not very visually appealing, the, the books. 
so people don't really buy them. But if, after they have the training, they're going to have a larger customer base. And in addition, something that really has been missing are volunteers and interns. If people want to help, let them help. And if they want to help for free, that's even better. <laughs> And in addition, like I've mentioned before, he wants to work on the work workshops, and I think that's one of the most important aspects of Sarita, to increase education and interest in literature, but he can't do that without funding. Uh, the educational implications, really, if it comes down to it, and this is ex if this is applied into education, they need to make sure that the Ministry of Education backs them, because if that doesn't happen, it's just going to go away again. And the way that they can do that is showing them, we have solid sponsors. There are people who are founding us. There are people who are interested in us. We have a solid customer base. Also, we've given workshops before, and they've shown improvement, improvement in education. And by doing that, the Ministry of Education, hopefully with the support of teachers who have Im implemented this process, can push forward, apply the the LUMPA, LUMPA, or educational organization, and push education forward. But that's really, really difficult. Um, like I said, they, to have profit, they need sponsors. They need a financial advisor to really understand that. And in addition, an advertising campaign, which they've lacked. When they did publish Arguedas' text, they did have it, uh, advertising, but it was so few and far between that not many people knew about it. And they spent a lot of time and money on that publication, and they lost a lot of it. Eloisa gives the promise of success. Like I said, they've published over 100 titles, and they're still going strong, and they keep growing. They have more volunteers every year. But Renzo has expressed that he's really worried that Sarita can't push forward. That's proof of that it can. And I told them, you just have to believe in yourself. You have to find people to help you. And even though you can't dedicate as much time as you want to to it, there will be people who will be able to, and you will be able to push forward. I think that Sarita will be able to push forward. And he actually contacted me the other day and asked me, hey, I wanted to talk to you about stuff, because some, some stuff has happened. I haven't gotten to talk to him, because I'm working on my life. And <laughs> but I, I'll talk to him soon, and we'll see where things are going, because I really think that Sarita is very, very, very promising. And I have some pictures. <laughs> So this is the workshop, that's the house that it's in. And it's in just a normal neighborhood <coughs> right by a high school. If you can't tell, the building right next to it was under construction, and that actually pours dust into the workshop. I don't know if it's there anymore, but he was having a lot of problems. Another problem was that it flooded. And he, the workshop is extremely problematic. It's small on top of that. It's kind of disorganized. He said he doesn't have a lot of space, so he has to work with what he has. So they have some old books, a lot of the cardboard. He said he's really the only person go who goes there. And he, he goes there once a week, maybe less, because he doesn't really have the need to. He can't publish by himself. These are some of the old titles. So as you can see, this one, it was after they had the instruction from the artist, so they knew what was more visually appealing. This one, not as much. This one, a little more. This is actually called silk screen printing, so they had an image already, and they would just, like on a shirt, they would just lay it down on the cardboard, and they'd print. And a lot of people had problems with that, because they thought it detracted from the creativity of the whole idea. This one is also silk screen printing, but it was interesting because they just printed off paper and pasted it to the top. That one's also silk screen printing. This is the cover of the book by Arguelas Tatatay. And this is representative of the indigenous people because the book is really about how society claims their, the, everything backwards with the country. And it says, they say that we're what's, what keeps the country from progressing. And he had it in Spanish and Quechua, which it originally was published in that, because he really wants to bring that into the light and show that there's still an importance in recognizing that. And that is all my work cited. <laughs> Any questions?
actually not the rural, but in these communities where they're not getting regular access to literature, were they expressing that they wanted more literature? Mm, not directly and not at first, okay. but there was an interest. At the beginning, of course, the people didn't really know about it, so there wasn't much interest when they would first come into the neighborhoods. But upon presentation, people would keep coming back okay. because they realized. And then they, they asked for those workshops to be continued. So okay. it interest developed. It generated over time. And then I also wondered how much research you did. I mean, you touched on it a little bit at the end, but just comparing maybe and contrasting the various Cartagena um, publishers around you know, the region. No, I didn't get to because this ended up being a lot more research than yes, I expected yeah. it to, but uh, there are tons of Cartagena's all through Latin America. Um, there's another one in Peru up north in the Loreto region, it's the Amazonian region, mm -hmm. and they focus on Quechua texts and oral traditions. So that was really interesting, but I didn't have the time or money to be able to travel up there. Um, there are over 17 in Mexico. And, but there are a couple countries that don't have any, like Panama mm -hmm. and Costa Rica, actually, which surprises me since they're one of the most yeah. financially stable countries. But no, I didn't get to. But that would be my master's thesis. I would be comparing them. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I thought this was a, a really interesting. I thought there are lots of master species within here. Just really um, but kind of building off. Sarah's question. I wonder if you talk about um, one view, uh, the, the kind of then view of looking at the combination of production and consumption of the, what you call the book object approach, which I'm not familiar with, and, and thinking about that community oriented way of, um, of existing as an organization or as, as a community. And then what happens when the now approach you described seemed to be more of a marketing oriented right. approach. If you could expand on what, um, what impacts you felt from people's, you know, what people said to you, that had on the community itself as well as the thinking about the consumption, production, distribution kind of network. So Renzo actually wants to also focus on consum consumption production and then distribution because he realizes that the community's opinion is extremely valuable, but without marketing and advertisement, you can't really distrib distribute. And right now, I think he's, he's in the planning stages, really. He's been working on it for two years, but he's still in the planning stages, so that's why he's stressing marketing and advertising and finances and funding and sponsors so much. He, does, he hasn't stopped caring about the community. That's what he wants to come back to. But he understands that right now, he doesn't have the power to do that. I think that ultimately, that's what Sarita is all about. And he does as well, the community. And that's what he wants to focus on. And that's what they focused on right away, from the beginning. But that's where they failed, because they didn't have the support, the financial support that they needed to really progress that idea. So to answer your question, I don't think there's more of a leaning towards marketing in the, la the latter mm, installation of Sarita. It's more that at this point, he's focusing more on marketing. But in the future, he'll go back to the original purpose of Sarita. He'll focus on what the community thinks for consumption, publication, and distribution. Any other questions? All right, well thank you.
but they only had one printing to those cities, and then it just died out because they didn't have enough funding to support it. And like I said, they had an underdeveloped distri distribution system. They did not have a central center distribution. So that was problematic because people didn't know where to go to buy the books. They didn't know where can I go to purchase something like this. Where can I, have a where can I buy a cardboard book? They did not know. They had citywide distribution, but it was kind of rickety because they would have agreements with bookstores for commission. If you sell our books, you get 30% of the income, but not anymore. And a lot of bookstores weren't willing to do that because they didn't make a lot of money off of it a few months, and he doesn't get to do it any more than that. He, on the other hand, he continues distributing through more conventional me methods like bookstores, or journals, magazines, any sort of publication like that, but it's not anything that's solidified. So Sarita, like I said, always had a problem with sustenance and more than just funding. And Sarda Riaga admitted herself, as well as Vargas Luna, that they had a lot of professional shortcomings that led to its downfall. They themselves did not understand how to run an organization. They didn't have administrative knowledge. They didn't have, like I said, a solid distribution anyway. And so bookstores would come in and out, and people just wouldn't know what to purchase. That was a huge problem, and that led to an inconsistent funding and sales. Now, there still isn't, isn't really a central distribution center. He says that their workshop is, but their workshop is literally it used to be a garbage dump in the back of a house, and you can't really enter because it's a private house. So they have a central distribution center, but nobody knows about it, and nobody can enter without a key. Um, he says they still present, he still presents at book fairs, but it's really infrequent because he has a full-time job. He does it probably once every while, appealing to university students to really push Sarita forward, hoping that they'll come to join him eventually but he didn't have the time or money to, so he didn't get to. And he wants to develop a Lumpa-like association, which he won't title it that, but he wants to develop again to teach to instructors, instructors so they can repeatedly teach to students. Um, and like I said, it's creating a familiarity. What this does is create a, create a familiarity of something that is so distant. You don't know the process, the process of production and you don't really care about it. You see a book, you buy it, and you think, I'm going to read it, and that's it. But there is such a huge process of production, and he wants the people to understand that. And so he creates this familiarity using things that they can find every day, cardboard, paint, and they create something out of it, and they make it their own. So there were problems with distribution, and at first, they didn't really have a plan for distribution. They thought, uh, Book Fair of, 2000, of Lima in 2004, we're invited to it, we're going to go. So they created a huge stand made all out of cardboard, and people loved it. And they came to it, and it really started Sarita on a roll. And they were really, really popular for a little bit. So they were allowed to temporarily expand nationwide to four different cities. I don't know the cities. They couldn't remember the cities, but they said that they expanded for a little bit.